All right, hi everybody, we're trying something new. This is your quick crash course on the new nation. You should have some background knowledge already based on your chapter one, lesson two readings. So let's jump right in. New nation. Okay, so know that we didn't just arrive at the Constitution. Keep in mind the events that took place leading up to the formation of the Constitution. First one, unreasonable taxes. Colonies felt like they were being taxed by Great Britain unreasonably. There were a lot of other issues at play, but unreasonable taxes eventually leads to the Declaration of Independence. We know that this leads to the American Revolution, and our first shot at creating a new government was the Articles of Confederation. So, we didn't get it right the first time. There were some problems, some strengths and weaknesses with the Articles of the Confederation, and we will get into those here. Then we have the Constitution. Took us a while to get there, so let's recap how we did. So the Articles of Confederation, they were written during the American Revolution. So we were planning to depart from Great Britain before we actually knew we won the war. So we have these articles ready to go, ready to execute. There were some issues. We didn't have a president. We did not have the power to collect taxes, at least the federal government did not have that power. Uh, the federal government or Congress, they couldn't even regulate trade between states. Everything was pretty much left up to the states. Uh, there, was also, <laughs> there was also no centralized currency. That means you could have Virginia bucks. You could have New York bucks. Imagine trying to do trade while each state has its own form of currency. That is not a pretty picture. Okay, so the 13 states... They didn't really want another tyrannical form of government, so they made sure that when they drafted up these new rules for their way of life, that they retained the power. Here, you're asked to go ahead and investigate the state powers and federal powers. Click the little Hamilton icon when you get to these slides to help you out identifying who had what power. The articles did do some good things. For example, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. During this time, these states were in the process of expanding, expanding their territory. So this group of states we now recognize was officially annexed to become part of the United States during this time. The government encouraged westward expansion. Uh, slavery was banned in these territories and public schools were mandated. That's kind of how you got here. That's a big deal. So we have these new territories and slavery is not allowed here. All right. So naturally, many Southern states would see that as a threat to their way of life, the way they make a living. Let's recap the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. No president. Uh, the federal government, national government had no control over the states. They didn't have the power to raise money for the things that they needed. And also, they didn't have the power to tax the states. That was left up to the states as well. You can imagine that will cause some problems. Problems. Speaking of problems, Shays Rebellion. Okay, so in 1786, more than a thousand angry, debt-ridden Massachusetts farmers tried to take control of a federal arsenal. Federal arsenal. That means a place where guns, weapons are held. Something that belonged to the new government itself. So the weak government, the weak central government, didn't have the power or the control to go ahead and stop them. There was no uh, federal army or militia. Uh, each state had its own militia, right? So you can imagine coordinating a way to stop these angry farmers was difficult. Also, the weak government didn't even have the power to really enforce these debts. So here again, the weaknesses of the articles are exposed. We need leadership and we need a stronger central government. Can't leave everything up to the states. So what did we do? The Constitutional Convention. This portrait should look pretty familiar along with some of the people in it. Yes. Okay, so the Constitutional Convention was originally called to fix the problems with the Articles of Confederation. Now, what they actually ended up doing was scrapping the whole thing. Okay, they said, you know what, we just need a, a whole new form of government. So each, each of the 13 states sent delegates, delegates meaning people to represent them to the Constitutional Convention, and they debated for days, days, 
days in secret about how to create this new form of government. And you have to give it up. They actually created something that lasted up until this day. But we have to keep in mind, if you look at the picture, that does not look much like America today. These men were making decisions for women, for Native Americans, for black slaves, people that are not pictured here today. So although they did create something pretty amazing that lasts till this day, they created it without the input of the people they were making the rules for. So I look at this picture, I think, wow, you guys did a great job. But I also think, wow, you forgot a lot of people when you were making these rules. So just something to think about. So we're gonna move on to a new segment here. Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Before the formation of the Constitution, we start to see a rise in what are now known as political parties. Federalists called for a strong central government. Federalists would have been in support of having a president, of having uh, more control over the nation's finances, of having more control over the states. They didn't want everybody doing their own thing. They had a fear of mob rule. So if all the states are doing their own thing with their own currency, how can we be strong as a nation? So they encouraged trade and they encouraged an industrial economy, not so much one based on slavery. Okay, so anti-federalists, they encourage a weak central government. Many anti-federalists couldn't picture the idea of going back to a world where one central government tells everybody what to do. They feared the central government having too much power. Many of the anti-federalists, including Thomas Jefferson, spoiler alert, favored an agricultural economy. People from very rural areas like Virginia would have been closer to anti-federalists. And that is because they had an agricultural economy and they would have been more in favor of keeping the Articles of Confederation. They didn't want to throw them out. They would have preferred to just keep them and adjust them as they were supposed to do when they first got together at the Constitutional Convention. But we all know that's not what actually happened. So just a preview of what you'll be doing here. In this number, you are going to go ahead and analyze the lyrics to a song. Now this song is not 100% historically accurate, but you'll be able to get a picture of what are some Federalist ideas and what are some Anti-Federalist ideas when you do this activity on the slide. Okay, so just a heads up, disclaimer, James Madison is portrayed as an anti-federalist, but in reality, he is a federalist, but he is from the South. He had his foot in both camps. So keep that in mind. Don't get fooled when you listen to this lovely Hamilton number. Keep in mind, James Madison was actually a federalist. So the Constitution and conflict, and there was no shortage of it when we were forming our new nation. Think. Why did federalists disregard the idea of amending the Articles of, Fe of Confederation? What type of government did politicians want to create at the convention? And what was a great compromise? What two plans did it include? By the end of this lesson, you should be able to answer these questions in part or in whole. What was the issue of slavery in the Constitution? Slavery is not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution, but it is implied. You'll see more of this in your crash course video later on. Okay, so the Virginia plan versus the New Jersey plan. There are so many ideas being floated around. How can we have representation in this new form of government? James Madison proposed a plan in which a bicameral legislature, that means a Congress that is split up into two different sections. So one of these sections would be determined by the population of the state. That is our modern day House of Representatives. So we did take part of this plan and we still live under it today. The Great Compromise incorporated elements of the Virginia plan. We'll go into the Great Compromise a little bit later. The New Jersey plan was a structure for the United States government presented by William Patterson. This plan wanted to make sure that small states had a voice. They didn't want their opinions being drowned out by these states with larger populations. So in the New Jersey plan, the government would have one legislative house in which each state would have one vote. So equal representation for the New Jersey plan. What we actually ended up doing was a combination of the two, combination of both the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan. So learn about this compromise 
this combination of the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan in this video. Okay, so make sure you go back to the slide deck and watch this video. I suggest um, watching the whole thing, but you can stop at the time designated if you like. You should be able to answer these questions. What were some problems with the articles? And describe some conflicts between the states with large populations and the states with small populations. And most importantly, where we landed. What is the Great Compromise? Also known as the Three-Fifths Compromise. It has since been amended but you should still know what it is. Three-fifths compromise. The Southern states wanted slaves to count towards representation. This would be advantageous to them when it comes to, you know, placing votes, for instance. They wanted slaves to be counted as part of the population, but they did not want to be taxed based on the number of slaves they had. Okay, so keep that in mind. Northern states would prefer that slaves did not count towards the Southern states population. Needless to say, there was a lot of slaves, all right? So they did not want them to count. If they were, their voices would be overrun based on the high population of people in the Southern states. The solution was this. Every slave would count as three fifths of a person. Three out of five slaves would be counted for the purpose of representation in the South. What might that look like? Okay, so that we have five people here, five enslaved Africans. Only three of them would be counted for the purpose of representation. Only three out of five would be counted. Oh, but they still can vote or participate in any of the democratic process, but their numbers were used to give the South an advantage. Okay, the result of this great compromise is a separation of powers. We have a legislative, judicial, and executive branch with checks and balances. We want to make sure that we appease the South by not giving the central government too much power that can't be limited. So we have checks and balances to make sure we have limits on the power of each branch. In case you don't remember, legislative is corresponding with Congress, House of Representatives, which today is based on the population size, the Senate, is equal representation. We have two senators per state. Doesn't matter how big or small the state. There we see the Great Compromise in place here. We have the executive branch that has the presidency and the judicial branch which holds the Supreme Court. Each branch has the ability to check the, and balance the power of another. And that was very much intentional. One of the last compromises we come to is the Bill of Rights. The South would not approve, would not ratify the Constitution unless it had a Bill of Rights. Many Federalists fought hard against this, saying, hey, you don't really need this. But it was the only way this Constitution was going to be ratified. So these first 10 amendments to the Constitution, which are still in play today, which we still live under today, protect the state's rights and the individual rights. The South wanted to guarantee that they would have their freedom. In order to get this Constitution ratified, the Federalists wrote the Federalist Papers. So a series of essays meant to defend the Constitution to the public, <laughs> Hamilton quote, and it was very successful. The Anti-Federalists did something similar. They were not as successful. So under the Constitution, we now have a president. In his first cabinet, he appoints Hamilton and Jefferson. They each have different roles, and all of these people take a strong hand in influencing the government we live under today. The first test of our new government was the Whiskey Rebellion, 1794. Congress passed taxes to help pay off the debts from the American Revolution. So taxing the whiskey was not a popular move, as you can imagine. Many small farmers sought to rebel, and then, thanks to the power of our new central government, Washington was able to send a large militia force to squash this rebellion. There we have it, our new nation. So that was a quick recap of our new nation and the key points in developing our new nation. So please make sure you do your slide activities with regards to this lecture and let me know if you have any questions along the way. Thank you for watching. It is to your benefit.